all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God decided to look in on our New Hope Assembly of God presentation today. We enjoy bringing these to you on Facebook and on our YouTube channel. And uh, we're, we've been uh, having some technical difficulties on our webpage, and we're looking to get our sermons right on the webpage where you can just click on sermons. We're working toward that. That should be ready soon. Appreciate your patience there. But you can always find us on our YouTube channel on our Facebook page. And I just want to again say thank you so much for texting me or calling, even emails. Uh, some of you I, I knew in high school, some of you uh, through ministry, but others I don't even, uh, a couple of people we met through these, through this uh, video presentation, and we're grateful for that. If I don't remember to say it at the end, I'll say it now. If you're ever in the Three Rivers area of uh, Michigan, which is, uh, we use this, or the right around here. On Sunday morning, you're more than welcome to join us at 10 o'clock. We'd be happy to have you uh, come and be part of our New Hope family. So, I want to talk to you today about one of the ordinances of the church. And what I'm going to be doing in the next few weeks is uh, picking out passages of Scripture and part of the story, moving toward Resurrection Sunday. Uh, some of you know it as Easter. 
uh, most of you actually. Um, and so we're going to look at some things that will happen that maybe we don't normally preach as we lead up to uh, the resurrection of our Lord. Um, at least I don't. Uh, I've been in this pulpit here for 28 years, and so my uh, temptation is to look for, uh, um, I want maybe temptation is not the word, the, the trial I have is to find insightful ways to make it fresh and new. And much like the Christmas story, the resurrection story is well known within the church, and yet uh, we want to preach it alive again every year and throughout the year. I mean, you can preach the resurrection story at any time and, and be powerful in a church service or, or in a video presentation like we have now. Uh, Jesus himself instituted the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper and communion are the same thing. It was the night before his crucifixion and uh, consists of two elements, the cup or the wine and the bread. Or some people like to call it the fruit of the vine, if you don't want to call it wine, for those of... <laughs> the bread symbolizes, of course, Christ's body and the cup, his blood, uh, and both were given up as a sacrifice for sin. Now, I, I, be careful, make sure you catch that word symbolize. We don't believe that when we partake of it or eat it, that it becomes his blood or becomes his body. It is the symbol of it. Um, the early church, they... Uh, were corrected by the letter to the Corinthian church, church of Corinth, I should say, um, and the actual practice it was given direction of how to handle that. We'll talk about that later. And uh, it was a proclamation to proclaim of his sacrifice and also a reminder. He says, do it until Jesus said, till I come. So it's a reminder that he's coming again, the second coming. We're all, Maranatha, we're all looking forward to the return of our Lord. Uh, it is intended, and I want to slow down here just a second. I'm just laying a baseline for the message here, basically. It's intended for Christ's followers, believers only. And, uh, and even they are to examine their hearts prior to taking it. Now, I want to stop because there is a teaching in my area that, that you don't have to be saved to take communion. And so, uh, or that maybe not have to, because we don't know the relationship every person has to the Lord when we serve communion here. Um, I would say that some of the teaching falls on the idea that even Judas was allowed to be at the table when you see the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. But if you look in John, you'll see that, Ju that jo uh, Jesus released um, Judas. And, and I'm not, I, I, I don't understand all the basis or the reason for that teaching. Um, I'm hoping, I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt, we would certainly want not want to turn anybody away because we misjudge somebody as whether or not they were saved. We don't even think like that here. If you want communion, if you choose to take it, we give it to you. In other words, your my job to determine whether or not somebody is a Christ follower. But we are warned in Scripture to uh, that it is for the body because it's communion with the body too. So it's communion with Christ or the heaven, God, and then communion sideways too. So. If a person is not a believer, not a Christ follower, then we don't want to commune with him. What you want to stay away from is any any person deciding whether or not somebody's a Christ follower. So the idea is, do we serve communion to everybody? Yes, I've never turned anybody away. But we what we teach that you that you should be part of God's family. You should be part of the body of Christ to take communion. This person judges for themselves. When we, 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 we serve it up front. They come up and receive it. And so I know this is a lot for the base, but I want to just make sure you, that you get what I'm teaching today. It's more of a teaching than a preaching. And I'm teaching this as we get close to Easter because this was the night before uh, and very close to his death and then three days later his resurrection. So um, it's important to be a, that, that we serve the people. And, um, and, then, and then even believers in, in my own life, when I, when I was away from the Lord, I did not, I did not receive communion because I knew my heart wasn't right. And I wasn't willing to make those repent and confess and, and repent and, and make, make my heart right. So believers are warned to search their heart. And it's a great time, a, a solemn time, where we ask the Lord, is there anything that we've overlooked or any sin of commission or omission in our lives? And we make it right. You also could, could receive, accept the Lord before you, I mean, 
That's why it's not our job to say you don't get to take communion. Someone could make a decision to receive Christ during the sermon. We usually have communion at the end. Other churches do it in the middle. We used to do it right in the middle. We've done it a lot of different ways. But that's up to the person. So I want to be clear. We don't judge whether a person's a believer. I never have. Because we don't know what's the last thing they were doing before communion. But we do ask people to be believers. And we ask our believers to have an up-to-date uh, time of searching and letting the Holy Spirit search them. And if they have, are in error or are missing the mark to make things right. Are we clear? I think we are now. <laughs> and I think it's well-deserved. Now, now the, and I did say the idea, well, Judas was at the temple. Yes, but look at John, I think it's chapter 3, where Jesus releases him and then, and then it happens. So uh, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, I'm not here to bash other churches and other doctrine. I just think we got to be careful when it comes to uh, this is one of our ordinances. Be careful how we teach it and how we serve it. So let's get quickly into the scriptures, Matthew 26. I'm going to go a little faster probably because of the, the time I spoke in the introduction. I normally do. Matthew 26, verse 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave to his disciples, said, Take ye, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, shed for many for the remission of sins. The new covenant. See, now uh, we, we live now. We know all this happened. These, these disciples were living it in the moment. And I'm sure they were confused, probably weren't as accepting. We accept it. We're grateful for it. But they were get, presenting. Just think of how the this is more new and more changed than anything the church has gone through. And yet we resist change because we don't understand it. We may like the things that way it is. And we don't want to hear. I mean, I can understand the disciples. What? I don't want your, your drink your blood, drink your body, wait, eat your body. Uh, and, and we know he was talking, trying to get him to understand that he was going to go through suffering and he was going to die and going to leave them. And, and it was just a lot to take. So I try to give the disciples a, a, a not a pass, but try to understand what, as they were living in the moment, that, you know, their, their faith was being tried and tested. And so the reason for communion, and by the way, communion and Lord's Supper, they're interchangeable. You can use it. Uh, it's a memorial of, he says, do this until I come, and, or in remembrance of me. It is a, a, a time of a memorial of him, remembering what he's done. It's such a wonderful moment, such a, a solemn moment, a personal moment to focus in on his love and willful commitment to do the will of the Father, the sacrifice he made, um, the... <laughs> The, the torture and the pain he went through, my sins, Paul says, because of our sins, and so that we our sins could be forgiven. Uh, the Lamb of God, who gave it, you know, Jesus John said, "Behold, the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins." What a wonderful! And thinking about that just makes it more personal. How much he loved me, he loves you, and went to the cross willingly, so that and died for us. Um, so, and, and we remember his life. You know, he lived a sinless life. He loved people. He forgave. He was a uh, a man of grace, but also he preached some warnings, warnings of a future judgment. And uh, it, 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 so we, it, it's a, when we when we really think about before communion, when I'm receiving it and not leading it especially, it's, it's interesting the things that come up in my heart and spirit about how much he loved me and the sacrifice he made. And it should be that way for all of us. Um, it's also a proclamation of our faith that his death was sufficient to pay for our sins. You know, it takes faith, you know, was Jesus enough? And uh, we conclude that he was enough. God agreed that he was enough. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It was God's idea, God's plan. Jesus said, not my will, but thy will to his father. And so we were reminded of that. That And our faith then is, was Jesus enough? I deal with people at times in counseling. They, they have to be talked through the idea. They think they've gone too far and done too much. And they've actually, if we're not careful, we can actually make an idol out of our sin. If we think there's a sin that we've committed that is more than Christ's death could uh, pay the price for, then we actually make that more powerful or greater than his sacrifice. So we have to be careful about that. You don't think of it that way. You're just so, people are so loaded with guilt and shame. I love them walking through the process of forgiveness and grace that God's word provides. And so we can, we also think about that. Sometimes when I, before I take communion, I'm, I'm reminded of all the things God's forgiven. Not not in a not in a shame thing. That's but just in a, a remembrance of, of how much He loved me, and, and uh, 
in the same way, I'm able to be blessed again by his forgiveness and that he was sufficient. Um, and it also, as I said, we proclaim our, our faith that Jesus will return. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. In other words, you're saying, you proclaim the Lord's death, it was sufficient, till he comes, we're waiting for the return of the Lord. I hope that as a believer, that you think about it. I try to think about it every day. The Lord could come today. He could come any minute. I'm waiting for the return of the Lord. I hope you are too. I believe you are. And also, it's a time of communion with him, intimacy, I receive his love, and also communion with the body of Christ. And so that's why we take it in a group setting the majority of the time, vast majority. I don't take communion by myself uh, as communion with God. I take communion with others, other believers, so it unites us to, together. The cup, the, uh, the cup is the blessing, the blood of Christ, and 1 John 7 through 9 says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son cleanses us from all sin. Thank God for that. Though our sins be as scarlet, they can be made with white as snow. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Jesus. <laughs> and I love the... I love the hymns. So many hymns focus on uh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. Uh, so thank God for the shedding of his blood is the remission of sin. And you, you see that in the Old Testament when, when the uh, lamb without blindness is slain. But now the new covenant is Jesus. And, and we we're grateful for that. First Corinthians chapter 10 says, the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion is, is not the communion of the blood of Christ, it's a question mark. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ, question mark. For that, though we are many, we are one, one bread and one body. So we first emphasize the, the, uh, the forgiveness of sins and the, the bread is the, that we're part of the relationship with Christ. But then Paul breaks it out in verse 16 and 17, his letter to the Corinthian church, that we also were reminded that we're, we're together. Communion can be a great time of unity with other believers. It reminds us that we are to prefer one another, love one another, be good to one another, because that's why we commune together. Now, again, have I ever taken communion with just one of them? I have. Uh, usually, I have, it's three. In exceptional cases of someone who just cannot make it to church, if they're married, we go out together, have a, and we, we commune together, the four of us. It's not ideal. But if someone can't be part of the body and they want to take communion, I certainly won't withhold it from them. But remember, communion is, is communion with God and then communion with the body. And, and uh, what, you know, I talked about examining yourself. I'm not, I remember it happens, it used to happen more often than it does, but today, because I really try to make sure I'm up in my relationships in a proper way, but Oftentimes when you're doing take communion, the Lord might remind you of someone within the body or someone that in your life that you're not, you're not right with. So we want to be right with the Lord, and then we want to make sure our relationships are right with each other too. And communion helps us do that. And I've had my, there's been my times when I was in communion and I was reminded of something I said or did that was unkind or wasn't proper. And I, I confessed it and after communion made that right. So God cares how we treat one another. And communion helps us to keep those relationships in step with the scriptures. Um, and then it goes on to say, we're told, uh, what, should, what should the atmosphere be? What should it be? You know, um, In the Corinthian ch church, they were turning it into a picnic, basically. A big old feast they were having, you know. Uh, somehow, they got their wires crossed, and it became very different than what it was intended. People were pushing and shoving to the front of the line, they were uh, not making. They were not waiting for people to come. It was really turning more into like a. And I'm I'm not against the, you know, church suppers or whatever. I'm not. You know, certainly there's a time of fellowship there, but that's not the atmosphere for, for communion. The atmosphere for communion is different. We need to be reverent and respectful, and it happens. I don't say automatically, but you can see a shift in a service sometimes when we start to serve communion. People begin to recognize. Those, what those symbols are, the blood and body of Christ. And also, they begin to, to do that. We've, we've taught them here at New Hope 
to start to think about their walk with Christ, what's in there. And there's a reverent that she can not, 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 not uh, you know, uh, silliness or, you know, we don't serve pizza. You know, you know I, I think it's, even when I was on a retreat and we were way out in the woods, we brought grapes and, and fruit of the vine and we were able to serve that. And uh, uh, the crushing of the grape became the, the, the fruit of the vine. So actually we focused more on the fruit and less on the cup because and the fruit, the grape symbolized the blood. And then we had, we had uh, unleavened bread that we were crackers that we were able to serve. So I'm not, I'm not saying that there are times, sometimes desperate times need desperate uh, measures, but the atmosphere, the tenure in the room needs to be one of reverence and respect. And it wasn't happening in the Corinthian church. And so Paul, you know, as he was known to do, was able to write a, a lot in his uh, letter to the, Corinth, the church of Corinth about, hey, knock it off. No, this is not a picnic. This is not a church dinner. This is communion. And we need to be reverent and respectful. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 says, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. That's not talking about my heart. That's not talking about me being unworthy. None of us are worthy without, in one sense, but in unworthy manner. And then, like I said, the silliness, the, the, the disrespect for one another, the pushing and shoving, all the things that can happen when food is served. He says, hey, you settle down. Um, so, so when he says eat and drink in a worthy manner, he's talking about the atmosphere, unworthily, unworthily, as it says in King James, I think. So we're already talking about you got to examine your heart. You got to be a believer. You got to make sure, you know, you search your heart. But also the atmosphere should be proper and right. And uh, and there's some variety you can use, but just make sure it's not it's not done without thought and reverence and being solid. And then use that time to be reflective, as I said, to search our hearts, receive God's grace and forgiveness. Um, Galatians 2.21 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me. I do not set aside the grace of God. So you, you want to let that really be reflective, self-examination, not looking around. I can't believe Joe's taking it. No, we don't do that. We worry about Steve. We, maybe worry is not the word. We're concerned about Steve. We, I examine my heart. Even as I serve it, I examine my heart. I want to be right with God. I want to keep short accounts. That's what's the term we use around here a lot. And then we want to have the attitude that we're going to sort of live in repentance. You know, when, when the Holy Spirit hits us, I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours. Um, and uh, we have to be careful. There is a, you know, and the, the author of Hebrews says in verse 10, for if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and very indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejects his Moses law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, how much more worse a punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who have been trampled the Son of God underfoot? Now, this is not talking about backsliding even. It's not talking about sinning, right? You know, and, and it's not talking about having is it. It's talking, it's not even talking about falling away from God. I believe this is talking about someone who is intentionally apostate after walking with Christ, raises it and denounces it. God is a liar. There is no God. I mean, it's a willful this is what I believe, a willful decision to sear your conscience. You declare God is a liar. There is no God and you walk away. That person say, well, Pastor Steve, how do I know I'm, I'm not living right? If you care about it, if the Holy Spirit is working with you at all, you're not there. Now, now you don't want to get there because there's the warning. So that's why we live in repentance, whatever. Because the person who was once, now this is the person who once walked with the Lord. And now he is renouncing everything. He's declaring the Bible's untrue. He's living a life of apostasy. And, and uh, apostasy is an act of refusing, deliberately refusing to continue to follow or obey or recognize Jesus is Lord, God, God's word. So it's a willful intense intent. Um, and living in repentance keeps us far away from any chance of that. And so don't, if you're backslidden, I'll come back, come back home to Jesus today, because it, it starts every backslidden person, every apostate person actually, started with rejecting the Holy Spirit's voice the first time. So you say, "Well, Pastor Steve, you're making me afraid." Good, 
you're in that place where you're pushing away the Spirit of the Lord when he's convicting you, today's the day. Come home to Jesus. And if, you, if it bothers you, if you care about it, then you're not too far. Come on home. Come on home. And then, so at a time of com com communion, before we receive it, people are, are, some people are confessing sins. Others are rededicating their life. Others are accepting Christ. Praise God. So, and you don't have to wait for communion. You can do it today. You can do it right now while you watch this. Come on. Jesus is waiting. His arms are open and he will receive you. In fact, he's reaching toward you. So I don't want you to think, oh, I've gone too far. If it matters to you at all, you have not. You have not gone too far. Holy Spirit is talking to you. Today's the day. You can do it. Come on. Ask Christ into your life right now. Ask God to forgive you right now. Come on home. I didn't know I was going to do that. I just felt led by the Spirit to make that decree. Come on home right now. Jesus loves you so much. He died for you. You can be forgiven. You can be clean. That relationship, notwithstanding, also, we want to recognize that we're with Christ followers. Communion can, the Lord's Supper can cause a lot of walls to come down. People can be forgiving of each other and, and work toward the unity, which God is pleased with. Um, coming together, Acts 20 says, on the first day of the week, the disciples came together, they broke bread, come together. Uh, that's what communion does. We commune with the Lord primarily, but also very importantly, we commune with each other. It also talks, talks about respecting one another. Remember I said at Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians, come together to eat, wait for one another. And again, I don't know any church that, that I've ever served in or never heard of, but apparently rushing to the front, putting out these big buffets and calling that communion. No, 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 no. We wait for each other. We can... We partake together. Um, sometimes I've had people gather as families, pray through about things, and together take communion. That's fine too. But I love it when the church together, we, we hold up steady, and then after some examination, we take the bread, and then we drink from the fruit of the vine. Together. Communion means together, coming together with respect. And then we want to, we do it regularly. In other words, we allow ourselves a time here uh, with COVID, it got a little tricky. I'm not gonna, but it, we try to do it at least once a month. Often it's the first Sunday of the month. We also would do it at a Good Friday service. We're doing it uh, today. And if you're watching this on Sunday, I think April 3rd, we're doing it today. And um, so, but you wanna, you wanna recognize coming together with the Lord, walking with him, clean heart, confess, repent it, and then go out with the brothers or sisters in our church, the church family, we come in together. Before I pray, we were, I wanna review our lessons learned then. These are just the highlights. Communion allows us to remember that Jesus died for our sins. And we, we take the time, it's intentional. You don't have to have communion to remember that. That's a good thing to think about every morning. Thank you, Lord, I love you so much. Thank you for dying for me. It also gives us time to examine our walk as we walk it out. Lord, as I, Died for our sins is the past. Walking it out is the future. I'm gonna, today I'm going to honor the Lord with my choices, with my conversation, and with my thoughts. I'm going to honor the Lord. So we want to examine our Christian walk. What do I have to change? What do I have to start doing that I'm not? What do I need to stop doing that I am? And it reminds us of a strong relationship with Christ and a strong relationship with his church. Now, some of you are watching this online. I'm going to pray in a second, so a minute. Some of you watch this online because you haven't come back to church yet. You haven't come back to the body. And COVID got us scattered, but it also got us to, you know, we think we can just read our Bible and, and you know, just pray a little bit, pray each day, and we're going to be fine. That's an extreme case situation. The church, the gathering together, that was God's idea. It's in his word. Do not to forsake the assembling of yourself together. We're in this together. And if we here at New Hope can help you in your walk, Come see us. If not, if you're watching this in some other town, make sure you're part of a local church. Find a great church that preaches God's word and truth, that lets the spirit of God move in their congregation, that loves Jesus and loves one another and be part of it. Not a perfect church, you won't find one, but go if you're a strong believer, if you're a believer, go and be blessed and be a blessing.
I know you can do it. God loves you and so do I. God bless you. Thank you for coming today. Lord, bless your word today. Move it on our hearts, Lord. Help us to receive it by faith as we walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God loves you and so do I. Thank mm -hmm. you.